As we near the end of our journey through 10 centuries of sacred song, it's clear that music in church has constantly had to reinvent itself, drawing on the strengths of the old traditions, whilst using the new to modernize and adapt itself to the current popular tastes. What singles out 20th century religious music is its huge diversity. It was this which the Teze community in southwest France seized upon when it decided to use music to spread its message of peace and reconciliation. Now popular in many countries, and especially with the young, all are able to join in the services by singing these tuneful and simple chants, many of which sound as though they could have been written several centuries ago. The chorus is usually in Latin, and the verses are truly international, sung or said in your own language. One of the secrets of Teze's success is that everyone takes part, whatever their musical ability. Those of us who write music for today's church have to make a choice. Should we, for instance, reflect the glories of the past, or should we come right up to date with the sounds of the 1990s? Now, there are people who say that those sort of rhythms don't belong in church. How can you possibly worship God with pop music, they say? Well, that's always been the case. The medieval monks at Reading Abbey danced around on Easter Day, singing their sacred words to a pop song. George Frederick Handel and Henry Purcell both wrote music for the theatre, and both wrote music for the church. The music sounded the same. It was only the words that were different. Purcell for the church. Purcell for the theatre. So if there's always been that connection between sacred and secular, then why not use it today with the modern rhythms of the 1990s? After all, we have the technology for it, and also there are many congregations who want to hear it. At St Andrew's Chorley Wood in Hertfordshire, the congregation grew so fast that it had to move out into a large school hall. Now even that's bursting at the seams. Matt Redman is its musical director. The one thing 
that's different between uh, our music and music of the past is just the style, really. It's the same heart behind it. We just got the hearts that are overflowing with love for God, and uh, it's just coming out in the music, just as it has through the centuries, even right back to the Psalms where where David was just pouring out his heart in song. We're playing all different kinds of music, really, and some really fast stuff and some really slow stuff. You know, there's times where we kind of joyously just giving it all, dancing about, um, really loud music, and, and just expressing again what's in our hearts. The cross has said it all. The cross has said it all. I can't deny what you have shown. The cross speaks of a God of love. There displayed for all to see. Jesus Christ, our only hope. A message of the Father's heart. Come, my children, come on home. The Cross Sell It All is um, a kind of upbeat kind of song. Um, I wrote it because I was thinking a lot on the, on the kind of subject of the cross, and I thought I, I want to write a song which uses kind of less religious language. The cross has said it all. The cross has said it all. I never recognized your touch until I met you at the cross. We are fallen dust to dust. How could you do this for us? Son of God, shed precious blood. Who could comprehend this love? The enthusiasm and energy of these bands is infectious. They use the musical developments of today to make complicated theological ideas understandable and to add an extra dimension to worship, just as the great pioneers of religious music have always done. What Matt Redman is now doing is no different from the Wesleys or Moody and Sankey. Their hymns and songs must have sounded just as different to their listeners as Soul Survivor does to our ears today. Christian rock will take its place in the long heritage of church music, just as those previous radical changes have done. Matt Redman and his band are helping to bring religious music bang up to date, even though there will be some people who will take time to accept it. I'm very unadventurous about music in every way. I know it's my fault. I know <laughs> that, well, what I mean is I find it very hard to appreciate ultra-modern music, very hard. But I suspect, I mean, Mozart is probably my favorite composer in the universe. I could spend probably the rest of my life listening to anything by Mozart. But I'm sure if I'd been around when he was born, I'd have said, what is this yes, modern yes, rubbish? Yes, you know, yes, I'd, I'm not right. saying yeah. that's the good music. Mm. I'm saying that I, it probably takes me 100 years at least to catch up. Uh, and I've no doubt some of the music that I can't sort of get now 
I would eventually see is, is just as accessible as, as the old music. So it's very much, I think, a thing of um, time and understanding it. And maybe if I heard a very modern piece over and over and over again, I would come to love it and enjoy it as much as the ones that I remember from my childhood. So you think that perhaps that we owe it to our children to give them this musical heritage, pass it on to them? Oh, yes, I think so. I mean, children are natural musicians, aren't they? they they'll stand up and dance around to music just by instinct or they'll try and join in singing when they're tiny babies. Oh yes, definitely. I certainly feel that one should give children the option to do as much of everything as possible. I mean, it's easier said than done, but certainly with music one would like to give them a background of a, as broad a spread as possible. I mean, rock music is wonderful in its own way and of course it's very seductive and accessible and we all love it, but it would be nice to think that it was balanced by a certain amount of classical music floating around in the background. So yes, of course I do. Now remember we've had the story of a little boy if religious music is to continue to appeal to popular tastes, it must be adaptable, but not lose sight of its roots. Diversity is the name of the game, and in schools where the next generation of innovators are now growing up, children need to find their own ways of expressing their musical skills. And we're going to put that into a musical pathway. Tradition and experiment must combine to make music mean something. Adam, why do you think people make music? To dance to it. To dance to it? Louisa, why do you think people make music? Um, to make them feel happy. Faisa, why do you think people might make music? To relax to it. To relax to it. For me, one composer who has brought the old and the new together most successfully is John Rutter. Now very popular in schools and churches throughout the country, his hymns and anthems take tried and tested musical styles and adapt them for the modern worshipper. His new settings of older words are tuneful, easy on the ear, and always bring the text to life in his own special way. In the next programme, I hand on the baton to my own choristers and we sing some more new songs to the Lord.